They have a high pressure culture and everyone is busy, busy, busy. This was leading to a risk of burnout and some of the key leaders were starting to feel overwhelmed. Welcome to season three of Conversations with Coaches. This is a stakeholder-centered coaching production where we believe everyone deserves a stakeholder-centered leader. I'm Brandon Murgard, your host for the show. This season, we go deep into the case study library to discuss the real life challenges of leaders and the coaches who help them succeed. As an added bonus, we're giving away the latest installment of our case study library, which includes case study summaries, show notes from each episode, and ways you can connect with the guest. Get your copy today at mgscc.net forward slash case dash studies. Today, we spotlight Corrine Hines, a visionary coach who transcends traditional boundaries to integrate both personal and organizational development. Corrine shares her journey with a leading modular building manufacturer, navigating through the high pressure challenges to transform leadership culture. Through strategic stakeholder engagement and innovative coaching techniques, Corrine not only enhanced leadership resilience, but also laid the groundwork for long-term organizational success. Dive in as we explore how laughter, curiosity, and some good strategic planning can lead to transformative change. Join us and let's find out more about the client. The client was a high growth manufacturer based in the UK and they had a massive contract coming up, bigger than they'd ever had before. And they had a group of leaders in the organization that several of them had had a promotion. And there was a real risk that they were already kind of under pressure. So the risk of that massive project coinciding with slightly out of their depth because they'd been promoted and overwhelm, it was just this like soup. Um, And HR... My contact in HR brought me in to talk about what that looked like and the risks. Because the risks were big. This is like a really high performance company and there was no room for these very, very important leaders to fail. So that's why the um, head of HR brought me in and we talked about what can we do? What can we do to, to help support these guys? Okay, so you have a you have a very high growth company. You have leaders who are high performers, recently promoted, and then boom, they're smacked right over the head with a massive contract, bigger than what they've had in the past, and this has just completely crippled everyone with the busy, busy, busy culture. The HR director reached out to you. How did they find you? How did they get in touch with you? They already knew me. It was works like this. So I had done some work several years ago with their board, board of directors, where they were transitioning themselves. um, And I did some coaching work, some leadership development work. This was before my time as a stakeholder-centered coach. Um, But yeah, I did some work with them and they progressed. They, They did that step up. And fast forward a few years and then I was in regular contact with HR anyway. But they obviously, as soon as they recognized these leaders, they contacted me, reached out and said, what can we do? And and actually probably what they asked for was, can we do a bit more of the same? Because that's all they knew and, and they saw that's how I worked. And I was like, actually, I see a place for a slightly different approach. And so that's why the the program we ran was very much aligned to a stakeholder-centered approach. Mm. What was their uh, what was their first reaction? I mean, you know, bringing something new in is rarely something HR is is passionate about. Something not invented here. What was their first reaction when you pitched stakeholder center coaching? Um, head, the the HR head of HR very very open, very up for things. So it wasn't a um, it wasn't a pushback. 
but they're busy, busy. This is the thing, you know, they're busy people and actually bringing a process in that's going to be a bit more than just let's have a coaching session once a month. That was the challenge. And they knew that me being able to work with them, they I had trust. I didn't know all of the leaders I was working with, but I was a familiar name. So I did have a, a certain level of trust. <laughs> but I was actually expecting quite a lot of them because there was more in this process than chat with me for an, an hour, like maybe they had in their heads of coaching. So I did have to build that up and work with them to understand why this was going to have a much bigger impact and I mean it wasn't plain sailing and I and you know it was it it was a little bit of an ongoing process and and I could talk about that later like slightly iterative so I didn't go in and say this is going to be what it looks like this is this is how much of a commitment it's going to be um I did talk about the process and what it would look like but I did adapt it to the different leaders actually in that group and their capacity and actually their level of seniority because some of them weren't as senior. So head of HR really keen. And and actually one of the key things that really sold it to him was that it was measurable because they're a high performance environment. And me being able to say, we're going to be able to measure this. And I, and I it, you know, I I pretty much linked my for their performance to to my invoice some of it I and I was so committed to it I was like right you know this if this doesn't have the impact you want it to have then that then you know I'm that committed to it so we had the measures in there and that's the thing I think that made it feel very different it wasn't just coaching because I do believe in coaching but I think because of these extra components that made it really attractive Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do find that in <clears throat> in very high performance teams that the the ability to say you're going to know how well you did and how well others did, everyone's going to have visibility on what you're working on and how you're getting there. It's a pretty compelling, pretty compelling statement. Um, tell me a little bit about the stakes, purely from your perspective, right? You walk into this environment and they're they're very successful. Would you from from your point of view, would you say, look, if I wasn't around, they would still stick the landing, it would just be less comfortable than they would like? Or was it a bit the opposite where, hey, unless these guys get some help and some leadership infrastructure for their continuous development, we're going to have a bit of a catastrophe. What were you seeing? I think that I had a cohort of six. I think that there were some in there who were going to be fine, but it would take longer. And they probably wouldn't reach the heights that they reached. There was some in there that were struggling and were in a really crucial role in that organization and that massive contract that if they didn't develop that skill set, there there was there would have been the stakes quite high. And there were some in there who really needed immediately to rethink some of the ways in which they're working. Um, and then there was like, there were, there was one in there that the, they probably just needed to tweak some things. So it was actually quite, quite a range, but the stakes were high in the sense of it was a bit of an unknown, massive contract. If I hadn't been there, would they have made those shifts? I mean, I'm not going to say that they couldn't have absolutely adapted though these are great people um would have been more painful noisy i you you do have to think that maybe it would be and actually there there were promotions in the mix as well so it it, they did actually they they didn't have that at the beginning like you're going to get a promotion if you succeed but because of the changes they made i think three of them got a you know decent promotion so that that was quite significant for them Okay, very cool. Well, you know, let's talk about the journey. What, you know, what did you set out to do with these guys? So, interestingly, although they're all individuals, I started working with them individually, like I would normally, having sessions with them, talking about what shifts they're looking to make, doing some 360 surveys so they could understand what behavioral shifts are going to really impact. Um, And in fact, we found out through doing this that the majority of them needed to delegate more effectively. 
that was a major thing for them. They, they were used to being hands-on, rolling their sleeves up, getting stuck in, working long hours. But actually, that wasn't going to continue being that useful as they grew. So there was quite a consistency across the group of that theme. So there was a theme that came out. So I was meeting with the head of HR regularly um, to discuss the program because it was kind of, you know, it was a real high stakes thing. And we realized there was this thing going on. So actually what we decided was to treat them like a cohort. So instead of just working with them, we ended up bringing them together as a cohort to share their journey around delegation. Now, there were a couple of other behavioral shifts in the mix as well that they shared. So, But that, but that was one of the little shifts that right at the beginning that, that was obvious that that was going to be really useful for them to act like a cohort. I didn't, we didn't know what that meant. <laughs> so it was very iterative. It wasn't like they're a cohort. That means they're going to do X, Y, and Z. It was like, let's get them together. Let's, let's do a session where they share and they get some of their stakeholders in the room. And so, so the purpose of that was to bring them together with this shared experience. And then I was having regular sessions with them about their own journey about how they were working with their stakeholders also about how we could make this not too much of an admin burden because some of their stakeholders were 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 like doing multiple <laughs> you know they had multiple participants so they were a stakeholder for more than like one and that and so it was managing that because that could have been really like surveys for everybody and you know stakeholders so what the main thing was how can we run this program so that the admin load is as small as possible so the check-ins are as efficient as they can be and they're adapted to the different level of seniority so some of them didn't do it as often but actually they still got that big benefit but I think the key bit in the process was the participant and their manager and having a joint session with them about the process, their journey, being like a really key stakeholder. So that that's how we kicked it off and that's how we thought about it like a cohort. I love these terms you're using. I bet that that was very attractive to them talking about, you know, efficiency and how can we maximize our outputs, minimize our inputs. And that seems to, it sounds like this worked very, very well in this high performance um, culture. One thing I'd like yeah. to get clearer on, um, so we've got a cohort. Were you approaching this um, as a, a team coaching type of engagement? Were you working with the six individuals and they happened to collide as a team from time to time? What did that look like? So they weren't the team. Uh, you know, they weren't in the, in the traditional sense. They were all, all across different parts of the business from manufacturing to projects to finance. Um, I... I would say I facilitated that group so that that when they were, when they came together I facilitated them as a group to look at what they're learning so far talk about delegation so we just we just did some general stuff and it wasn't like I went in there with a big learning package about delegation I was just like let's just you've learned the stuff let's just share yeah okay. like let's just talk what have stakeholders suggested what have you tried yeah. how did it work what didn't work you know, and we, and we had just such great, you know, and it, but the thing with it is it was awkward to begin with for them because they'd not done this type of stuff before. So they didn't know what was expected and they were a little bit stiff. So when we did a little launch at the beginning, they were, they were like, what is this stakeholder thing? You know, what do you, what do you mean? And, and then by the second time we got them all together, they were just such a different bunch because they'd been going through some cycles of getting suggestions and trying things out and having these great kind of conversations with people around them. So they were much more familiar with process and understanding it. And some of them turned into real kind of um, uh, cheerleaders, you know, for the whole idea and the whole feedback. And they're like, why are we not doing more feedback? Why, why, <laughs> why can't this part be, be part of our culture? So so it was great. I was like, yay, and why are our meetings not better? And, you know, so so it was great. But what and what was great is their manager, who who were like board members mainly, um, 
they were like massively part of that process, even though they weren't obviously a participant themselves because they were having to get, and I would end up having sessions with them, helping them give suggestions, you know, what that looks like and, and actually brainstorming with them things that they could give because they're a bit like, what do you mean? It's, you know, what does that look like? So I so I do sessions like that. So I was very flexible in who I was talking to. It was a stakeholder one week. It was the actual participant. It was the group to to help them incorporate this in with still without making it too big a commitment that they'd have to, you know, feel like they had to have these massive meetings. I was like, no, after a meeting, just drop something in and that's it. That's it. You're done for the month. You know, this is this is amazing. I'm hearing um, I'm hearing threads already of, you know, shortening the learning curve for some of these leaders for uh, cultural transformation. I am already hearing the leaders in uh, looking backwards retrospectively saying, why are why aren't we do why, why weren't we doing this already? And these are common, um, common comments that we get, especially at the HR uh, and the HR function saying, man, we just, we feel a bit behind, but let's, let's transition to what happened. Okay. So you've worked with these six leaders, you're, you're kind of organically finding the path. What happened at the end and what did the measures look like along the way? <laughs> so what happened, it was, you know, some of the, some of the great things that were happening along the journey were seeing, say somebody that's like grown up with the business and was in quite a responsible position, but leadership presence didn't really, didn't really have that. Didn't think of themselves a leader, so they were that they were in that space. Seeing their journey from like realizing that actually this looks different, and for them it was not so much about delegation, but more about being straightforward and owning their area and having direct conversations with people and seeing the shift that they made and the conversations they had and the changes they made in their area. So those were the kind of on the go, like as, as we went kind of process stuff. Um, delegation was something that so many of them realized needed to shift, changing how they were working with their teams, how they were using the, the teams like as a resource and then shifting themselves into more of a coaching approach. So we ended up having a lot of like role play conversations with taking a coaching approach and what questions to ask and the expectations they had of their people. So there was a lot of that happening as we went. Um, and so obviously we did these little facilitated sessions and in one of them, the, and who's happy for me to share this, the, there was a, head of finance and there was a finance manager so the finance manager was one of the participants his boss was the head of finance and the plan which was explicit was that the head of finance wanted to become like he was the finance director needed to shift into group director so that they're part of a bigger group and he was going to be he needed to make that shift but in order to make that shift he needed the finance manager to shift into his role now. So he needs to make that move. And so in one of these facilitated sessions, you know, we've really got into the detail and there's this vulnerability to be able to talk about what the measures would be, because that's a big thing, you know, what's going to be different. And so, you know, I was there with the two of them in the group and they were happy to talk about it. What needs to shift? What do you need to see? We're like a year from now, we six months from now, what do you need to see? So the more senior, the, the, the more senior finance person said, my diary needs to look different. I need to be able to move 40% of what I'm doing currently. I need I need you to take that. I need that to be different so that I am able to actually move into this group director role. And so that was a really specific shift that was needed. And obviously the finance manager needed to do some stuff behaviorally, challenge themselves in order for them to be able to do that. Confidence, leadership presence, how he, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that came up. So that was a, a very distinct measure. So there were throughout the group, there were different levels of what the measure would look like for success and dealing with that sense of overwhelm. 
I mean, the, the major measure was the massive contract came in. They didn't crash and burn. They successfully delivered it. <laughs> so, you know, the, the reason we were there, it was fine. It all went well. They've, they've won more massive pieces of work. The, um, I think three of them got promoted to associate director level. Um, and the ones that didn't, mainly it was just the type of role they were in. They were, they were, they were seen as being more senior and it was useful. Probably one of them, um, just stayed steady, bit of a steady Eddie. And, and that's like fine, you know, like not every one of them, like massively transformed there was you know it's like i say one of them were, that recognized there was some shifts needed and did some work and still got in his survey that we did at the end still got a percentage shift so they 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 all got um a percent you know a, a shift in the positive so their perception of their performance all went much all went positive so min, you know average of plus one um, but I think the thing that made this quite distinct for me was the after action review. So after action review can just be a set of questions they answer about what they were trying to achieve, what impact it had, what their measures were. And that's great. But because they're a cohort and because they are kind of quite high performance, uh, when I was talking to HR, we, we talked about how we can make this a bit more of an organizational development impact so it's not just about me as a leader improving it's about what can we learn from this cohort as an organization and how can we increase the visibility of these senior people with the board so we put together a half day session and i helped each of the leader practice their presentation and they use the after action review as a springboard to present so this it was a great other skill set they had if they some of them were really familiar with it, some of them not so. So they were able to go up there in front of the whole board and they're, you know, it's not it's not a it's kind of to say it's a scary environment isn't quite right. But you know, it's kind of quite high pressure. They're there, you know, I felt for them. <laughs> and they they went up there and they presented and it was like an FAQ session afterwards. And it was just such a great vibe and such a lovely way of trying to do more and, you know, boost that part of the process so that you could really see the impact. Okay. So if I, if I kind of summarize what I've heard first, the, the results speak for themselves. Um, we've got a, uh, a plus one average or greater on the mini survey when, in which they're all focused. Many of them are focused on delegation. Um, you've got the finance director who wants to offload about 40% of their current workload so they can go on to be a, a, a fan, finance director for the group, for a larger group. You've got three people with promotions, one of them with uh, continued job security and stability. <clears throat> and then this is, the, I'm, I'm so fascinated by this, this, uh, this kind of peer learning model that you've put together where everyone's sharing their AA, their after action review, their AAR, and then you do an FAQ session at the end. Now, I've not seen this. I think it's brilliant. Um, if I wanted to replicate that, you know, what kind of procedures or how did you set that up to make it so that everyone could learn, but everyone was also confident to take questions and give answers? Well, I think it was really important to give each of the leaders time to prep with with me so that they felt like they really owned that presentation. And they they had a um, structure, so they had a format. HR put together a little format for them, so they had a, a PowerPoint that they just needed to fill in, but the, they practiced it. And one of the great <laughs> skills that I hope that they take with them is I just help them declutter and become more succinct and more straightforward because it really was a skill set that I didn't realize needed to be worked on until they sent me back their presentations. And it was just like, here's every single thing I think about this. And I was like, okay, <laughs> so let's redo this, <laughs> rerun. And then I got them to like be really, you know, pick out the priorities, 
share some of the key learning and, and really help them like work that room. Now, some of them were terrified, shaky, and, and that was fine. But what was so lovely is that I invited feedback from the group as well. So the board, what they noticed, you know, I kind of facilitated that. And it was so lovely because the one that was the most nervous, he he was like standing up doing this and the uh, commercial director just said, there's no way you'd be doing that before this. And that, wow. that's it, you know, even if that were, even if that's the main thing you've got from this, the fact you're stood up there and you're just going, I am actually, I'm good enough, you know, because that was a big thing. It was like, I am actually good enough. So I think, Setting it up so that there is structure, so the, the presentation piece is, is very structured. Having some questions that you can prompt, because sometimes I was saying, so so group, you know, group of directors, um, what have you noticed in the business from these people? You know, so I was kind of asking some of those questions to get the discussion going. And then one thing we did do, which I think is just like pushing it, pushing it up was I then helped HR, head of HR, run the little mini session after which, which is, well, what can we learn about this? Like, what what does this say about our organization, the, 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 the journey these guys have been on? What does this mean for the strategy for next year, the leadership and development strategy? And so then we, and then we managed to get some themes about Retent, you know, there were several themes that came up, things about how it plays a part in retaining our people and team performance and things like that. So we had like about five different themes that came out of it. So, but I, you know, semi-planned that, but partly it was, let's just see, (laughs) kind of see where this takes us and see what appetite people have got for delving into this. And it was just very positive. It was, it was a really positive experience to end on. So it was like ending on this big kind of celebration of their brilliance. So it was good. I mean, it's, it's impressive when a coach can make change happen on so many levels. You've got the very individual level, the mindset, their paradigm. I'm, I'm good enough to do this all the way to the upper organizational level where you're having this cultural change where the directors are looking and saying, here's, precisely what I see, but let's actually go back and talk about what we can do as a group to continue uh, the momentum that we've built. And that is powerful. Let's zoom into to your eyes. Um, what did you learn from this? I think key things for me were it's okay not to know. Like it's okay to not really know how this is going to play out and to change things as we go. So to not necessarily have to have everything predefined at the beginning and to be able to try some things, see how it goes, and then like the peer, the peer thing wasn't something we dis- decided we were going to do at the beginning, but knowing that actually a lot changes in like, I think it was over seven months to a year, a lot changes. So like at the beginning of that time, we we weren't to know some of the things that happened and some of the kind of shifts in the organization. So going, I learned that I don't have to be in control of every single step along the way for it to organically grow and, and make a difference. I think, I think this has developed over the years, but I really realized with this particular engagement that personal development is one thing, but now I've done this and obviously with a stakeholder centered approach, it really does incorporate, it just just embodies this, but leaving the organization behind with sustainable change it couldn't have been done any other way. Like if I had just sat in a room with the finance person and coached them, yeah, they would have had loads of insights and interesting stuff, but the environment and the and the relationships, that's such an important part of it, their relationship between the 
the head of finance and the other directors and that cohort, I was leaving them with bonds that were much stronger. And that wouldn't have happened had it been in my bond with them would have been strong, but I would have, I, I'm not there now. I, I wanted to leave the bonds between those people in that room being strong and all the stakeholders beyond being strong. So yeah, it taught me that I haven't got all the answers and that's okay. Yeah. And it kind of, you said as a coach, don't, uh, don't be a bandaid over a wound. Like you need to leave at some point. You need to. Yeah, yeah, we talk a lot about, um, Corinne, uh, stakeholder centered habits is something I've been speaking with clients a lot, a lot now. Um, and we had a, an interview recently with, uh, Bill Auxier, who, um, who very, very well articulated. Don't, don't offer coaching, offer cultural transformation. Don't offer one-on-one -on -one me and you coaching offer. We're going to, we're going to change. You're going to change things. I'm going to help you do it, but I'm going to be gone. And unless you really solidify those habits, you're going to fall right back into, into what you were doing before. Um, you know, you've mentioned something that I, I'd love to talk about here, which is um, this concept of mobilizing the middle. Tell us a little bit about this mobilizing the middle. Yeah, I think I think it was my mentor, Peter Hawkins, Professor Peter Hawkins, who always talks about mobilizing the middle. And, you know, we do, we, we're not looking for top-down cultural change, but then sometimes bottom-up change isn't kind of like neither of those may be right for what you're trying to do. And so when I when I went in, the head of HR wasn't saying, can we do a cultural change program? You know, he was just looking at individuals and going, oh my God, they're overwhelmed. They need, they need help. But they really were kind of quite this bridge between the board and some of the other people that in that lower seniority in the organization. So actually working with them they were able to have great results with their stakeholders on the board and people in their team. They were able to have a great result there. So I think that phrase often comes to mind when I think about where you're going to get the most traction and and have the, the easiest place to do it is, is sometimes with that with that group that you, you might call in the middle. Um, and I think that really happened here because of the kind of relationships they had already and how they were able to build on it. It wasn't like they were like really new in role or like kind of a million miles away from the board and they were going to have to like influence it. sort of really going to be really hard for them. They were already influencing at that level. So being able to get them moving meant that this program had much more success, I think. Okay. So in, you know, in the context of stakeholder center coaching, mobilizing the middle might be targeting the middle for coaching, involving their seniors as stakeholders, and then finding the synergies through this peer learning and the eight, the after action reviews to say, how do we continue this momentum top to bottom? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. De definitely connecting, connecting the parts. Mm -hmm. That's what I love. Um, well, our listener base is, uh, we've got a lot of HR people, we've got a lot of coaches, um, and we also have a lot of team leaders who, you know, may be struggling with delegation or may be um, working with a coach on other things. What advice would you have for these people in the light of the learnings that you've had from this engagement? I think that, I think if I was going to give HR advice about what, you know, they're in the middle of a program. One of the things I did with my head of HR is we had regular conversations and and when we were a partnership, it wasn't like I am so wise. Like I, I came with my knowledge and my understanding, but he came with this massive knowledge about the organization and like we couldn't have done it without each other. So I would suggest if you've kind of outsourced something, if it feels like outsourcing, then like, how can you shift that so it feels like partnership? I think partnership is where it's at. That's how I always view my relationship with businesses. So, so if you're in HR and you've got someone doing a coaching program and you feel like there's a distance, then bridge that gap, bring them in. How can you work together better? Um, team leaders, I think that how can you 
I suppose one of the things with this particular program is the board. How can you involve the most senior level in? If they're distant from this process, how can we incorporate them in the mix? Even if they're not really a full stakeholder, I, I get, I let them off. Sometimes being a full stakeholder, if you're a really senior position, is is it's a big commitment. But I would say, how can you loop them in, it so that you're getting feedback and feed forward suggestions. And coaches look for. I really like finding those opportunities to do that group. So you might not feel confident in that area, but. They've got all the stuff in the room if they've been doing stakeholder centre coaching for a couple of months. Just get them together and get them talking. You'd be surprised at how interesting and useful they'll find it. How awkward they'll find it, first of all, but then help them get past that. Yeah, and I've also enjoyed, um, you're, you have a very organic approach, right? I mean, stakeholder centre coaching is generally, here's what we're going to work on, here's how long we're going to work on it, here's who's involved when, here's our session schedule, like that's determined in session one, and then we execute the plan, which is very different um, from from most coaching. You take an even more organic approach of here's session one. We're going to figure the rest out as we go. How do you build the confidence in yourself and in um, how do you build the confidence in yourself and in the client uh, without that structure to know that you're going to be able to achieve those objectives without kind of an agreed step by step path? I I flex. Some people want step by step and I will do that and I will I like one of the things I will do if I can is agree how often we're going to meet and and have that as a regular diary. If we're going to meet and I and I've really um made that half an hour a week generally. It's just a regular and it maybe they need a bit more at the beginning but I don't lose sight of that structure because if it's like, oh, I'll we'll meet when you need me, it, that that's not how I think it works. So I definitely have that structure in there. And I just think that over my experience of working with all different types of people in this process, that I work with them and their appetite for how often they're going to work with their stakeholders and actually get results with them. So I suppose confidence and interest in one. I have done it so much that I feel confident in their, in them. You know, I have confidence in them, but I definitely like, I suppose like a toddler, I start close, <laughs> close reins. And... and I I'm like very much like we're going to do this followed by this. So I do start a little bit more like that. They're like, I'm holding the reins here. But then as we, as I, as I can see that they are like really on board, then, then we flex and we, we, we build the program to fit them rather than you need to have the sessions every single month. And this is how it's going to look. And so I have definitely gone, okay, you need to do regular. What does regular look like? How's that going to be helpful? When are you going to do them? And, but I have, uh, I suppose I have moved away from just a very uh, same program with every single pe person I work with. So, yeah. But I do have to, like, make sure I keep on a certain track because I don't want it to just be you get to the end of the time and actually there hasn't been the same rigor. So it, so it, it is a bit of a balancing act. But different people works differently well, i think i think that you start with structure you start with an agreement here's what we're going to do until that's no longer relevant and when that happens we apply reflexivity we figure it out together is that right yeah i like i like to think of this as experiments so we do we're doing a like a little lot of sequence of experiments and Ugh. with the structure of you're going to have stakeholders you're going to have check-ins with them and I'm going to help you with the wording you can use so that you're not having to invent all of that. So that I so I use all the process stuff around that, but I also really encourage these experiments that they're, that they're trying to do. So that's where we end up into this world of it looking all a little bit different for each person. Corinne, if I am a 
team leader, if I'm an uh, HR director, uh, if I'm, I'm just curious to know more about your work, how can I get in touch with you, learn more about you, follow you, listen to you? Listen to me? Well, it's funny you should say that. I do have my very own podcast. Um, it's called The Visible Leader. And it's on all, all your podcast platforms. Um, so get the spelling of my name right and the visible leader and you'll find me. Uh, so it's Corinne, C-O-R-I-N-E, and then Heinz, H-I-N-E-S. And look for the best, best place to find me is on LinkedIn. So come find me on LinkedIn, come connect with me, come have a chat and check out my podcast, which is all about challenging leadership conventions. So I'm really interested in people that are doing things differently and getting success and results with their people. So if you're interested in finding out more about that, come find The Visible Leader and then come chat with me on LinkedIn. Corrine Hines illuminated the pathway from high pressure challenges to strategic leadership and organizational development. Corrine's innovative approach, combining personal growth with a broader organizational change, offers invaluable lessons on establishing a leadership culture. We hope you've been inspired to explore new strategies in your own leadership journey. Remember, all the case studies of this season are available for download at mgscc.net forward slash case dash studies. The link can also be found in the episode description. And if you'd like to better understand the foundations of leveraging stakeholders and measuring results in your coaching, then join the free training program Foundations of Stakeholder-Centered Coaching, where we share the philosophies and frameworks that guarantee improved leadership effectiveness in 12 months or less. You can register for the free course at mgscc.net forward slash foundations dash course. Until next time, this has been another episode of Conversations with Coaches by Stakeholder-Centered Coaching, where we believe everyone deserves a stakeholder-centered leader. Thank you for joining the conversation and stay tuned for more stories of leadership transformation.